Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Rich Ekman, President of the Council of Independent Colleges. The Council of Independent Colleges is the major national service organization for small and mid-sized independent liberal arts colleges and universities in the United States. Rich has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Rich, for joining us today. A pleasure to be here, Mark. So we are at a very interesting time in the history of education in the United States. Talk first about the organization and the, uh, and the constituents that you serve, and, and then let's talk a, a bit about the challenges that small and mid-sized colleges and universities face in today's educational landscape. Very good. The Council of Independent Colleges is, as you said, the national service organization for the smaller private institutions. There are about 650 of them in the U.S., and they range from a few that are quite wealthy and highly selective, such as Swarthmore or Oberlin, right. to the vast majority that are not, that um, uh, draw students um, mainly from their own regions, and admissions are not all that competitive, and they struggle to uh, make their ends meet with their limited budgets and smaller endowments. The big issue that uh, has changed the work of these institutions has been the new attention in the last few years from many sources, from the White House, from big foundations, on encouraging more Americans to go to college and to complete college degrees. And what this means, of course, is that the Yales and the Harvards and the Stanfords cannot do this job alone, but every college and university, public and private, needs to step up and uh, be prepared to uh, enroll more students and to give them the kind of experience that will lead to timely graduation. Our colleges, which uh, have terrific dedication to teaching and very impressive graduation rates, uh, are trying to play their part in this new environment. So in a sense, we have a, a, an, uh, an overabundance of demand we have a situation where your constituents need to adjust to that demand, yet retain their, their standards, their, the, the excellence, while it takes time to get new faculty in the pipeline and to, and to scale to this challenge. Yes, and the thing, Mark, about the traditional college-age population that's just now entering the, the, the point where they're applying to college is that it's disproportionately distributed in the, in the United States and the Southeast and the Southwest and con includes unusually large numbers of first-generation low-income students. So at the same time that there is a national policy priority on increasing participation in higher education, which is a wonderful thing, we're finding that the students who are enrolling in colleges and universities come from families where they need a lot of help to adjust to college life and overcome some not very good high school preparation in many cases. So at that point when a student comes to one of your members, that school has to also be equipped not only in the traditional way of, of being able to teach but also in a way of transitioning um, students from an environment where uh, the standards might not have been so high um, even being on time, showing up uh, to class on time might not have been as, as important. And certainly managing their executive functions, managing the, the process of enrolling and, uh, and doing homework on time and, and understanding the, the additive nature of education. Um, that all needs to be afforded to these students in the first year or two. All of the, all of the above. And what uh, so many of our institutions take pride in is in the comparatively large percentages of low-income and first-generation students right. who enroll. And that's possible, of course, because the colleges make a high priority out of raising private scholarship money to supplement Pell Grants and uh, other federal funds. And it does lead to very impressive graduation rates. If you compare a low-income student who is enrolled at a non-elite private college with a student with the same high school credentials who's enrolled at a branch campus of a state university who's enrolled with one of the for-profit education providers, uh, the track record at the private college is on average much better in terms of the timeliness of degree completion and the percentages of students who finish their degrees. 
So the argument that I find myself making these days in this enhanced policy environment is that if the country really does want to increase successful college completion and degree attainment, the private colleges have a big role to play. And uh, particularly at a time when state budgets are being hard pressed, it's a role that should be built into the policy thinking much more deliberately than it seems to be right now. And you're now. talking about the very practical hard realities of funding, the business reality of how do you ensure that these added programs that are required to, uh, to drive these graduation rates, that these added programs are funded because they're not going to be free. They don't come cheap. And, and it's very difficult to put somebody's name on an endowed position for what turns out to be a transitional program to help uh, young people make that transition. Well, let me illustrate it with a few numbers. If the typical private college sticker price is in the order of $50,000. Right. In fact, the typical private college student pays about half that amount. And if you look at the amount of institutional financial aid that's distributed to students, it's equal to six times the amount of federal aid that's distributed to private college students. And the result of this is that the average family income of students at private colleges and universities in the United States is actually lower than the average family income of students public four-year universities. So these institutions take great pride in making college possible for students who really need it and who deserve it and who come out of backgrounds where they might assume uh, uh, frequently that they can't afford to go to a private college. In fact, they can. Does the community college system have a uh, complementary role to play uh, in, in this, in this uh, constellation? Absolutely, and it's growing. You know, the, because uh, all college uh, has seemed to be expensive in a time when the economy has been weak for longer than any of us expected, and because in some states the number of spaces at the four-year public universities has been limited, California is a good example, right. many students are starting out at community colleges. And increasingly now, the four-year and two-year institutions, public and private, are beginning to develop very clear pathways from the community college to the four-year institution to complete the bachelor's degree. So we see now in the community colleges many more students who intend right from the very beginning to get a bachelor's degree. And uh, uh, there's mixed evidence as to how students who started out at community college do. We think we have evidence that suggests that those students who transfer to four-year private colleges have better degree completion rates than those who transfer to four-year public universities, but it's not uh, absolutely persuasive evidence. Do your members see, your, see um, themselves in competition, in funding competition, in uh, student admissions competition with each other more or with the, uh, the state-supported uh, colleges and yeah, universities? Excellent question. If you had asked me that question, 20 years ago, the answer would have been clearly that it was competition among private colleges. But now what's clear is that a family does not make a decision uh, to look at only private colleges or only public universities. There are many ingredients that go into the choice. And so at a time when the typical college applicant is applying to many more colleges than was the case a few years ago, it's almost always a mix of public and private colleges and for different reasons for selecting each one. One is a wonderful math program. Another one has a terrific swimming pool. Uh, <laughs> and it, so it's mix and match in a way. Social that is, life? Well, sure, all those factors. And they're all important. The pipeline of experienced, gifted uh, uh, faculty is, is a major issue and um, there is a evolving sensibility surrounding uh, curriculum, um, an evolving sensibility uh, and, and a debate that has gone on for a long time about uh, liberal arts versus other forms of, of education. How do you feel that the United States stacks up in terms of the supply chain, as it were, of this critical, critical resource to allow these uh, schools to scale and, and that will allow these schools to maintain their standards. Is the United States competitive in the development of great faculty? Yes, absolutely. The American graduate universities are just superb. They're the best in the world. And they produce 
leading scholars in almost every field, and these days they're producing an overabundance of PhDs who are available to take, to take teaching jobs in most fields. Um, so the issue isn't having highly talented people entering the college teaching profession. The issue is matching up those people with the institutions that will make the best use of their talents. Now meanwhile, the oldest form of higher education in the United States, the small liberal arts college, is being copied all over the world. And uh, everywhere you go, there is great interest in this form of undergraduate general education that we've developed quite effectively. And uh, uh, it takes slightly different forms in different parts of the world, of course, but there are many self-consciously American-style colleges being created in many places. There are a few universities that have created uh, branch campuses, such as NYU's and right. Yale's and some of the others, but there are many more freestanding institutions that have only loose ties to uh, an American institution. What other services do you provide your membership? Most of our work, Mark, is services for the leaders of our colleges and universities. So we run many programs for presidents and provosts and deans that, in effect, help them do their jobs more Professional development. Yes, and you have to understand that in a small college in a small town, uh, being a president is a pretty lonely job. And it's only through these opportunities to uh, work with other presidents and with some expert uh, who serve as resources that that sort of professional development is possible. It's difficult to admit that one doesn't know um, a, a, the solution to a problem when everyone is looking to you as the leader who really knows all, all who has all the answers. It's pretty well known in leadership circles that uh, a new person in a presidency of any kind of organization would be well served if he or she had a mentor. Mm -hmm. And yet we've heard stories from some newly appointed presidents who go to their boards and say, I'd like to have a mentor, and the board will say, well, wh why? We hired you to do the job. How come you don't know how to do it? You should be all-knowing and all -seeing. Exactly. Right. So there's a, a lot of uh, uh, give and take in this process of learning the many, many responsibilities of being the CEO of a, of a college or university. And you can't possibly have had direct experience in all those areas of activity before you take the job. And so a lot of it is brand new. And in, in terms of, of the work going forward, are you trying to uh, help your, um, your, your members um, grapple with the issues that they confront in a way that is uh, more organized, that, that, that takes some sort of a national approach where the organization can actually take positions as a whole? with the power of your members behind it? Or is it mostly a matter of, of figuring out uh, ways to have the organizations help themselves, counsel themselves, provide mentorship for themselves um, through your organization as a conduit that connects those various dots? Yeah, it's, the dividing line isn't quite the way you asked the question. We're okay. not a lobbying organization, but we do try to make the case more generally as an advocacy um, uh, Advocacy, activity. but not lobbying. Right, right So, right. for example, uh, a couple of years ago when the New York Times ran a series on student debt that led off with the example of a student at Ohio Northern University who had $150,000 of debt and treated that student as if he was typical. Right. Uh, we not only went to see those reporters, but we also prepared a packet of facts uh, about student debt and the myths about student debt, we sent it to all our college presidents and we said, we hope you can use these facts to good advantage with your uh, admissions office, with your local newspaper, uh, with your Rotary Club, whatever it takes. And we gave the president tools then that they could use as they went about making the arguments about the affordability of private higher education in their own way. Now, this dividing line between lobbying and other sorts of activity becomes a little fuzzier in the current era when the uh, U.S. Department of Education seems quite inclined to get involved in the internal academic affairs of colleges and universities in a way that I think is quite unprecedented. 
you know there's a federal definition of a student credit hour now? No, I did not know that. Yeah, and um, the president's uh, proposed rating plan for colleges and universities also has caused a number of uh, my members and me to be concerned about the ability of the federal government to mix apples and oranges and come up with a single rating plan that fits everybody. But surely you, you're, you're not against standards because you, you have standards of, of course, your own. Of course. So how does one create standards um, in a way that's appropriate to your membership? Well, we're great believers in uh, voluntary solutions to problems whenever you can find them rather than relying on the government to impose solutions. So take the voluntary accreditation process that's existed in America for some time. It has done a pretty good job of keeping up standards. And in one area of particular interest to the Education Department right now, the programs that prepare K-12 school teachers, the uh, story of the efforts of the voluntary groups that have accredited teacher preparation programs to ratchet up their standards is a real success story in voluntary efforts to raise those standards. So what is the role of the Common Core for your members? Are your members embracing those elements of the Common Core as a, as a standard for the entry of, of students? Or are, are there more divided views of, of how the Common Core might affect their work? Yeah. The views vary. And the Common Core is not the only thing out there that's uh, being used as a mechanism to raise standards. The Council has been very, been very active in the Degree Qualifications Profile Project that the Lumina Foundation has yes. uh, set about. I don't know how much you know about that. Well, why don't you describe what they're doing? Well, Lumina has been concerned that there be equivalency uh, of quality measures of degrees across institutional lines. And the Degree Qualifications Profile, DQP, is a mechanism they developed and invited the council to assemble a consortium of institutions that would try it out. And we did. And what many of our colleges reported was that this was a way of raising standards by having greater awareness of how what was going on at their own place fit in with what was going on in many other places. From the Lumina Foundation's point of view, this is partly connected to the goal of international equivalency of degrees as a way to aid the workforce development. Right. But it also has served these internal educational purposes by allowing a college to benchmark what it's doing, either in a major or in a general education program against what others are doing. So many of your, uh, of your initiatives and the initiatives that you pursue in partnership with organizations like Lumina are, are really about positioning your members to deliver the kind of outcomes for students that they are obligated to deliver in a way that takes advantage of the expertise, the knowledge, the practices that other members of your ecosystem and, that are, and, and, and those organizations that are adjacent to your ecosystem develop. That's right. One of the great strengths of American higher education is the diversity of kinds of institutions. And we think all of these institutions play an important role in making options available for students who have different interests and different values. Uh, being able to sustain that is one of the challenges that we are facing right now. And different is interests and different uh, values, uh, different, uh, a different focus brings us right back to the liberal arts. Absolutely. And uh, if I had to make a generic case for our kind of institution, it would be that the curriculum is grounded in the liberal arts, and no matter what students major in, all students are going to be exposed to a very healthy dose of all their coursework being in courses in the humanities and social sciences and natural sciences. And the natural sciences are part of the liberal arts, of something course. some people forget. Uh, and what we believe we're we see happening to students' lives as they go through a program like that is the development of the ability to use effectively many different modes of thought as well as becoming familiar with a very wide range of bodies of knowledge and new cultures and new experiences in the world. 
So an organization that is conceived as an advocate, as a mentor to the mentors, it is a very complicated environment that you manage, and in, particularly, in particular, um, uh, coordinating the, the, um, the work across 600 members of colleges and uh, small, mid-sized um, organizations with different regional needs, uh, different specific needs for each of those, those members. Rich Heckman, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us, and thank you for your insights. My pleasure, Mark. Thank you.